So we're on the subject of long suffering. Now, a good working definition for the term is the following it means slow to act, or slow to act out, rather, to show restraint, bearing pain or suffering wrong without complaining. To have patience and endurance. And again, this is called a fruit of the Spirit. And by that we mean it starts with God. If you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, you have this already on the inside of you. I get so frustrated with Christians that say, I don't have any patience. I don't have any long-suffering. I don't have any joy. I don't have any peace. You're saying something contrary to the nature that God put on the inside of you when you got saved. Now, granted, maybe those things are not manifesting in your life like they ought to, but they are there. If they're not there, then we have a bigger problem we need to address. We need to address the issue of salvation. Are you saved? Because as a saved person, these things are already there. It's called the fruit. And Jesus says, you know the tree by the fruit it bears. If you are an apple tree, you bear apples. You don't have to try to bear apples. You don't have to think about it. It comes naturally. It's there. Okay? Now, sometimes that tree needs to be pruned back some. Sometimes it might need a little extra fertilizer. Sometimes it might need some water. Sometimes it needs a little extra sunshine. But that tree on the inside has the ability to naturally produce apples. And you, as a Christian, are naturally prone to produce everything that's listed over here in Galatians when it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Now, you might need some pruning. That might, that might be a problem with you. You might need some sunshine. You might need a little bit of extra watering. You might need to get in some deeper soil somewhere, maybe some fertilize that soil or put some uh, nutrients in that soil that's maybe missing. But you have the ability to do the things that we're talking about. Long suffering starts with God. Take your Bible. And let's look at some scriptures. Go to Exodus 34. Remember what definition we gave now. Exodus 34, verse 6. All right, we'll start with verse 5, actually. Verse 5, and the Bible says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. Watch what he proclaims. This is God's nature. This is who God is. When you want to think about God, think about this. The Bible says here, The Lord God, merciful and gracious. Thank God for that. Amen? Amen. He's merciful and He's gracious. That's where we get our grace from. We get our grace from the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? Long-suffering. We need to thank God for that. God is patiently waiting before He pronounces judgment on this world. Right now, the reason this world is not burning up right now with God's wrath is because of God's long-suffering. Because if it had been me and you, it had been gone a long time ago. Let's just face it. Amen. God has long-suffering. Thank God for some of us, that long-suffering extended us individually because we were adults before we got saved. 
Now, I was, I was a kid, but thank God for some of our brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ, you waited a long time before you gave your heart to Christ, and God's long-suffering was right there along the way waiting for you to get in. That's called the long-suffering of God. All right, the Bible says long-suffering and abundant in goodness. And let's not forget this one. Truth. Truth. You can't separate God from His truth. The Bible says, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Now, I'm glad he put that in there because that means that those that refuse to repent, those that refuse to turn to God, God's justice is going to be on those people. He will not clear the guilty. He will not. He is not um, James Scott Farron or some of these other uh, highfalutin lawyers that will get you off even though you've done wrong. Amen. You've got to go through the blood atonement of Jesus Christ to get cleared. You've got to have a new heart. You don't change, uh, change flip over a leaf. What does that say? They change a leaf. Flip over a leaf. Flip over a new leaf. You know, uh, make a new resolution and that kind of stuff that people say. You know, those things don't work with God. What God is looking for in an individual when they come to Him is a new man. I said a new man. Not an old man that's made some resolutions and made some promises that he knows he can't keep. You know, we do that every year around uh, the first of the year, you know. I'm making a new resolution this year. I'm not going to eat chocolate. I'm not going to uh, drink sodas. I'm not going to do this. And about two months in, they're back to the uh, same old thing. Why? Because your nature is to go to those things. You have to have something supernatural put on the inside of you to have the ability to serve God. Or you won't serve Him. Now, a lot of people have tried. And they wind up with a counterfeit religion. The Bible says they that worship God must... I want a suggestion. Must... Worship Him in spirit, lowercase s, by the way, and in truth. You must worship Him in the book. And that's where you find the truth. Because Jesus Christ is the truth. You want to find Jesus Christ, you find your Bible. It will describe Him. It will tell you what He is. It will tell you what He looks like. It will describe Him physically, spiritually, <coughs> doctrinally. It will give you everything you need to know about Jesus Christ. Now, I have never seen Jesus Christ physically in my life. But I have spiritually. I know what Jesus Christ looks like. If we were to walk in this room right now, I'd recognize Him. Do you? You got a Bible, don't you? It describes Him. The problem with some Christians, they don't spend time enough in their Bible to recognize who He is. So if they come into the room and they say, mm, He looks familiar. <laughs> no, you better get a little closer than that. It goes from being familiar to being absolutely sure I know who He is by the Spirit that's inside of me that bears witness to Him. And by the way, your spirit will bear witness with other Christians that we are brothers in Christ. Amen. The Bible says here that he's long-suffering. Let's look at some other passages. Let's go over here to Psalm 86. Psalm 86. And look at verse 15. 86.15 But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion. That's what the Bible describes Jesus Christ as. 
The Bible says he was moved with compassion when he saw the multitude. He saw that group of people out there. They were wandering around like a sheep, a sheep, bunch of sheep without a shepherd. He said he was moved with compassion for them. He was a shepherd. And he's looking at those sheep and they needed a shepherd in their life. Now you as a born again Christian ought to look at people that are lost, undone without Jesus Christ, and be moved with compassion for those people. Not hatred. Not bitter skepticism. You ought to look at them the way God sees them. They need something in their life that they're missing. I've got the answer. When a man comes to me that's not saved, I want to win him to Christ. I don't want to sit there and beat him over the head with the Bible and try to condemn him before I can get him saved. He already knows he's condemned. He don't need you to remind him. (laughs) He needs you to present the truth to him, yes, and he needs to hear the word of God from you, yes, but it ought to be done with love. Paul says, speak the truth with love. This is what he says. Gracious. Here's that word again. Long suffering. Plenteous in mercy. And truth. I'm glad God's got plenty of mercy. I'm glad He gave me that mercy day in and day out, even after I'm saved. If it weren't for the mercy of God, I couldn't stand before you today. If it weren't for the mercy of God, I wouldn't have woke up today. If it weren't for the mercy of God, I wouldn't be where I am today. It's God's mercy that keeps us alive and keeps us ticking. Amen. Remember that, folks. Don't get into this arrogant attitude like a lot of Pharisee Baptists get into. That I'm sorry, brush God, and I'm just, I'm special, and God can't do it without me. God can absolutely do it without you. He's been doing it for 6,000 years without you. What do you think? I mean, uh, he'll do it 6,000 more years without you if he tarries. <laughs> Who do you think you are? The Bible says he's got plenty of mercy and plenty of truth. Let's go to Numbers. Let's see it again. It starts with God, folks. I'm telling you, everything we're going to look at starts with the Lord. And when you get a revelation of that, it will help you understand how the fruit of the Spirit will operate in your life. It's by allowing God to operate in your life because He's where the fruit is. Um, Numbers 14, verse 18. Now look at what Moses is saying here. The Bible says the Lord is long-suffering. What do we say the definition was? Slow to act out. To show restraint. Bearing pain or suffering wrong without complaining. You know how many times you've caused God pain? And he hasn't acted out? Paul says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. That means causing him pain. You know why? Because everywhere you go, he goes. And when he hears you talk, sometimes the way you talk, it brings him pain. When he sees you do some of the things that you do on a daily basis, it brings him pain. And he's slow to act out on that. His long suffering causes him not to act out what is by nature he could act out and be justified he's restraining himself because if he gave you what you deserve buddy you'd be in hell amen but his long suffering is there his his ability to be able to be slow to act out think about Noah and the flood we'll look at that in a minute in 1st Peter but, he, but when he was uh, told them that he was getting ready to destroy the world, he said, I'll give him 120 years. He didn't have to give him that long. But somehow along the way, he knew it was going to take Noah a little while to build that ark. 
And the ark was being built not for the people to get in, but to keep the world out. Let that be a lesson to you. Noah never preached to anybody that they needed to get in that ark. You won't find that anywhere in the Bible. That is a misnomer that people have said about Noah. That he preached 120 years trying to get people to get in the boat. That's a lie. He never preached to tell anybody to get in the boat. He preached to them that God's judgment was getting ready to fall and that they were getting ready to be destroyed because they were wicked. God created that uh, situation and told them to build that ark so that the animals could get in and Noah and his family could get in, period. And his long suffering was toward Noah, a man that knew God. Because he could have said, hey man, you need to hurry up. I'm ready to get this show on the road. I'm ready to get this thing going. But his long suffering was there. We'll look at it in a minute. All right, go to Psalm 86. We already looked at that one, never mind. Let's go ahead and go to uh, 1 Peter, chapter 3. I've heard whole, I've heard whole sermons. Boy, no, I preached it. Didn't get nobody saved. They won't try to get nobody saved. Amen. Watch this. Verse 20, which sometime, excuse me. Let's go back to verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. We sometimes were disobedient when once the long, watch this now, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, where a few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. Now Noah is the one that God extended the long suffering to. It won't to the world. God was prepared to destroy the world on contact right then. But Noah, the Bible says, found grace in the eyes of the Lord, according to Genesis. So the long suffering was extended to him. <coughs> so he was waiting for Noah to get that boat uh, finished so he could uh, get in the ark. Remember that when you're listening to people talk about that. And talk about Noah, you know, and he was preaching and all that stuff. Was Noah preaching? He absolutely was. Look at um, 2 Peter chapter 2. Look at verse uh, 5. The Bible said, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah. Did you get that? He saved who? He saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. He preached righteousness. God is a righteous God. He will not tolerate disobedience. He will not tolerate sin. He will not tolerate iniquity. And because of that, you folks are getting ready to die. <laughs> Because y'all have mixed yourselves with the sons of God and y'all have produced an offspring that have no souls. They couldn't be saved. They couldn't be saved because they didn't have a soul. When you start taking animals and mixing them with human beings and you take uh, animals and mixing them with spirits and taking spirits and mixing them with human beings, the thing that comes out of that is a thing that is soulless. It has no soul. It cannot be saved. Look at Genesis. Genesis. 
chapter 6. Verse 9. Well, let's go back to verse 5. Actually, we'll just go back to verse 1. Look at verse 1. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of Seth... Is that what it says? No. What does it say? Then why did these stupid scholars run around saying sons of Seth? Because they don't know how to read. That's why somebody needs to teach them how to read. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they looked and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, "My spirit, lowercase s, shall not always strive with man, for that he is also his flesh. Yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years." There were giants in the uh, earth in those days, and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. You'll find that uh, mentioned again in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 28. And that, that term there, mighty men and men of renown, is what you find in the history books and in mythology, in Greek mythology and uh, Roman mythology, as the gods, Zeus, Thor... Diana and all those things there, that's what it's a reference to. That's what was produced. So when you go back and read that Greek mythology and that Roman mythology, you're not reading mythology at all. You're reading history. Those people saw those things and they walked around and they talked and they moved and they were controlling people. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord. First mention. First person in your Bible to repent was God. <laughs> Why don't you try that out in Sunday school sometime somewhere and see how they look at you. Yeah, I told my cousin that. I go to Sunday school with him. I mean, he looked at you sideways, didn't he? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I gave him the verse. <coughs> and uh, no one had ever... I haven't made the connection. The very first time the word repent shows up in your Bibles in that verse right there. And it's not man repenting, it's God repenting. The problem is we have defined repent as repenting of sins. We forget the word repent means to have a change of heart and a change of mind about something. And God can have a change of mind about something. The Bible says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man which I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. Now I want you to notice something here. Get into a little doctrine here. Watch this. <clears throat> He's going to destroy man. He's going to destroy beast. As in the mark of the beast in Revelation 13. And look at this. The creeping thing. That's an unclean spirit. And look at this one. The fowls of the air. Just like Jesus said over there in the Gospels. He says, and the fowls of the air came and choked the word. <coughs> so it becomes unfruitful. <clears throat> Those fowls of the air are mentioned in Revelation chapter 18. And they're connected to Rome, as in the Roman Catholic Church. And God says he, He's repented that He. Why didn't He say anything about any of the other animals? Why did He classify those three right there? We know, according to Scripture, that He destroyed all of them, but He distinctively points out these. Because there's something there prophetic in that verse that brings you over to the end times where the man of sin is going to show up, the son of perdition, the beast is going to show up, the creeping thing is going to show up, and the fowls of the air are going to show up. Now think about that for a while and chew on it. Get back to me. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
<clears throat> the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Another thing you want to notice is when a man or a society rejects God and rejects His words, they instinctively become a violent place to live. That's why America will never solve the problem of violence until it solves the problem of its relationship with God. You've got to get that right first before you get rid of the violence. You cannot get rid of the violence until you get rid of the wickedness. Until you get rid of the heart that is corrupt before God. The Bible says here, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. All flesh. That's why God had to destroy it. God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in it the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. <coughs> then he goes through and describes the ark. All right, go down here. Um, verse 18. Excuse me. Look at verse 17. Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. When is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. Is there anything so far that you've read where it says, Noah, I need you to get out there in the street for 120 years while you're building this ark. I need you to preach and get people in this ark and try to get them in so that they can be saved from the flood. Have you read any of that yet? That's because it didn't happen. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark, to keep them alive with thee, and they shall be male and female. And then he goes on and tells you what to bring in the ark. Now look at verse uh, chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said to Noah, Come. Did you notice that? Did you notice it says come, and it does not say go? You know why? Because God's in that ark. And God's in there and He's telling him to come where He is. And thou and thy house into the ark. He did not say, Come thou and all thy house and everybody that you win. <laughs> For they have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And He talks about the animals again. <clears throat> now, that's what you have. God's long suffering was toward Him. Go down here to verse 16. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. And how many movies have you seen of Noah and the ark where Noah shuts the door? Every one of them. I have never seen a movie yet where they got that right, where it shows God shutting the door. But the Bible tells you God shut the ark. He shut it in. That's why that boat didn't sink. Because God had His hand on it. Amen. God took any imperfections that Noah did and took it and straightened it out while that flood was coming through there. Because you got to realize when this water came on this planet, it slung things from one side of this planet to the other. I've got some videos over there that were put out by Kent Hoven. And he shows in the archaeological record where all these animals that are up on top of mountains like sharks and uh, snails and things of that nature with lions and tigers and bears, oh my. And all that stuff is all jumbled together up on top of a high mountain where there, 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 logically there should have not been any water at. How did all that stuff get up there like that? Because when that flood came, that flood came where there was water pouring down into the earth, there was water coming up out of the bottom of the earth, and it was shooting up spouts of water like this, and it was shooting down water like this from the great deep up above, and that stuff, that stuff was pouring in from both directions <coughs> so that things that were in America were slung all the way to Siberia in a matter of seconds. Now you talk about some speed and some water and some flinging 
That's what was going on. And that boat was coasting on the top of that thing. (laughs) All right. That's what you got there. Let's go to Romans chapter 2. You say you believe all that stuff about the flood? I sure do. I'd be a fool not to believe it. Romans uh, chapter 2 verse 4. Now this is good. The Bible says here in verse 4, Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? I want you to think about what you just read there. God's long suffering today in the church age is there and his goodness is there to bring you to a place where you repent. Repentance is part of the gospel and it is part of the atonement. You have to repent to get saved. What do you mean, preacher? I mean you need to have a change of mind about who you are. You need to have a change of mind about who God is. You need to have a change of mind about how you approach this book. And you need to have a change of mind about where you're headed. And the first thing that you have to do is get your thinking straight. And that is by the gospel being preached to you. And when a preacher gives you the gospel, it ought to change your thinking. If it don't, you can't be saved. Jesus Christ says, except you repent, you shall all... There you go. (laughs) You're going to perish. Just like they did. Just like the people in Sodom and Gomorrah did. Lot didn't preach to them either. (laughs) He tried to get his own family out. Now Abraham was trying to plead with God. Abraham's doing this number right here. Let's see, I've got got a nephew and his wife and he's got this many kids and I, I think there might be a few more over here in the family. And he's bargaining with God based on what he thinks is there. If there be 50 righteous, will you spare the city? I said, well, actually, I don't have that many there. I said, uh, if, there's, if there's 10 there. And what did God do? Every time he gave a number, God agreed to it. Because God already knew how corrupt the place was. God already knew no matter what number he gave, it wasn't going to be enough. And you know what Lot was doing the whole time when the angels came there and told him, hey man, this place is getting ready to burn to the ground. You need to get out of here. Get your family and get out. The Bible says Lot tarried. He took his time getting out. You're talking about long-suffering of God. God was long-suffering in that situation because he held back until Lot and his wife got out. And Lot's tarrying. You don't think that was pushing God? I just want to look at this place one more time and look at all the neat little buildings and look at that shop over there. You know, I used to shop there all the time and look at all these nice places. I'm telling you, it's just it's amazing artwork here in this place. You know, it's beautiful sculptures and uh, architecture. I mean, it's just look at this place. I just can't imagine God destroying this place. That's the way some Christians are today. I don't believe God would destroy America. America's too good. She's done too many good things in the world, you know. She's the beacon of light to all that are in darkness. You're so stupid. (laughs) America's so wicked and so corrupt and so vile. Don't you know? You're believing what the media is telling you about America. The Bible says here, Despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering. You despise that? You take advantage of it and say, well, God's so good and God's so merciful. He'd never do anything like that here. Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. 
You need to change your mind about who he is and what he's going to do. Because, baby, he's getting ready to burn the whole town. And I've got news for you here in America. If the Lord tarries or if he don't tarry, he's going to burn this whole nation to the ground. God's going to do it. And he might use the bear up there in Russia to do it. Or he might be using the China, Chinamen over there, over there in China to do it. But God's going to bring judgment on this nation because except you repent, you shall all likewise perish, and that includes America. Amen, amen, amen. Take your Bible and look at Romans chapter 9. There ain't a nation in the world I'd rather live in than America. I agree with you on that. I mean, it's the lesser of two evils. <laughs> and a nation in the world is better to live in, as far as I can tell, than America. But you know where I'd rather live, probably, if I had any other place in the world to live, and it might surprise you? Israel. Because that's where the action's going to be, baby. <laughs> that's where it's all going to take place. And you get a front row ticket there if you get there. You get to see it all happen. Front row and center. Romans chapter 9. Look at verse 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath... Uh-oh. Willing to show his what? Wrath. And to make his power known, enduring with much long-suffering... The vessels of wrath fitted for destruction, fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared in the glory, even us who he hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. God has taken his long suffering and he has put it out here. The Bible says, enduring with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. His long suffering allows him to be able to let these filthy, vile lunatics run the streets, run the Congress, run the government, say the vile, filthy things that they say, and he not destroy them. That's his long suffering in action. Because what they deserve is to be knocked off their block and destroyed immediately. And God's long-suffering is allowing that vessel of wrath to continue to go for a period of time until His mercy is shown to the uh, vessels of mercy. Second Peter. I don't know if we've read this one already. I think we have, but we'll look at it again. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Chapter 3, verse 9. Now this is one that a lot of people read, and they read it out of context. Surprise, surprise. I want you to pay attention to it. I'll tell you how most people read it in churches. And they use this verse as a verse applied to a lost man. And then a lost man in the verse. It's a reference to Christians. The Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to who? Usward. Usward. Usward would be a Christian, right? Yep. To usward, not willing that any should perish. God's will is that no Christian perishes. So guess what? No Christian will perish. <laughs> His long suffering is involved in that though. Why? Because you as a born again Christian don't always live up to what you ought to do for God. You don't live right. You don't talk right. You don't do right. So God's long suffering is there. Putting up with you. And your nonsense. Amen. Thank God he does. The Bible says, But as long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You as a Christian need to have some repentance in your life. Change your mind about how you see things with God. You ought to repent too. Amen. 
has some change of mind about some things. When you read this book, you understand this book is reading you. Amen. And it ought to change you. It ought to change how you look at the world. It ought to change how you look at society. It ought to change how you look at your government. It ought to change how you look at your TV sets. Amen. It ought to change how you look at your preacher. How you look at your church. How you look at your devotions. How you look at your family. Because this book has a specific way that he's ordered things to be. And if you don't do it according to God's way, then you're just not you just you're just wasting your time. You ought to repent. <laughs> Let's look at another one. Look at verse 15. The Bible says, look at verse 14. The Bible says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. That ought to be the goal of every Christian, that you be without spot and blameless. Just because you have eternal security working in your favor does not give you a pass to live like the devil. Let me just say that one more time. Because too many Christians in our circles have that mentality. They think because they're saved and they can't lose their salvation, they can just live any way they want to and get off scot-free. I'm here to tell you there's a judgment seat of Christ and there's going to be some suffering there. There's going to be some weeping there because you are going to get your britches whooped there. Amen. Amen. He's God. God tells you that once you're saved, you ought to work your own salvation out with fear and trembling. And the Bible tells you that you ought to try and strive to be without spot and blemish and blameless. You've got to be blameless before Him. I know that you're in an imperfect body, but that's no excuse to just live like the devil. I'm going to do what I please, praise God. No, you, you can go ahead and do that if you want to. Your life will be cut short. God will bring you home early. And it won't be a pretty early either. It'll be a suffering early. I've seen some Christians that got their life cut short and suffered all the way to their last breath. Whereas if they'd just done what God told them to do, it would have been so much better. They could have went out in victory instead of went out in shame. And now they got to go before the Lord with a red face. Look at verse 15. Count that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you. Listen to that. The long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Why? Because if he didn't have long suffering, he would have destroyed you. <laughs> so because he has it, you're spared. Let's take your Bible and look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verses 1 through 3. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. You're to walk worthy. You're to do things that's worthy of the call that you have been given. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. <clears throat> because God is long suffering, He's instructing you to use that long suffering in your own walk. To walk it out in your daily walk with Him. See that? Alright, now let's look at a Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. 
Look at verse 9. Trying to finish this up today now. Verses 9 through 13. The Bible says here, For this cause also uh, for this cause we also, since the day that we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Do you pray one for another? And to desire that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience <clears throat> and long suffering with joyfulness. You to do it with joyfulness. You don't go out and say, I got to put up with this man today. <laughs> I got to put up with this woman today. Now you do it with joyfulness. Look, Lord, they, they obviously don't understand things like we understand them in the church or they don't have the knowledge that we have in the Lord right now. Help this person. Pray for them. Paul tells you here to pray, to be filled with all knowledge of his will and all wisdom, spiritual understanding. He prays that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. There's some good prayers in this, folks. This is some things you can pray for your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to be in this church. God gave you a good laundry list right here through Paul of things you can pray for one another. All right, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Look at chapter 3 of Colossians. Look at verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness. When people see you, do they see you as being a kind person? Or do they see you as a grumpy old grouch? I don't like to go around them Christians. They're always complaining and negative and grumpy and they're just hateful. Now I've heard that more than once over my years of being a Christian. And it should never be said about you. That's sad that that's the testimony of the world towards you. Amen. You need to change that. You need to be kind. It ain't going to hurt you to be kind. Humbleness of mind. Meekness. Uh-oh. Long-suffering. Forbearing one another. Uh-oh, my goodness. Forgiving one another. That was another one. If you may have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. God gave you a list there of things that you ought to strive to be in your personal walk with the Lord. You want to know what God wants you to do? I just gave them to you. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 16. Paul talking about this. Look at verse 15 rather. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Christ, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. Paul's the example. You never find anywhere in the scripture where Paul the apostle complained about his situation. Now let that sink in for a minute. You know some of the things that Paul went through? He was beat, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he's out in the middle of the ocean. He never complained, Brother Earl. 
He never complained about anything that he was going through. Even in the church, when he was dealing with the problems in the church, he gave them what God told him to give them, but he never complained about, you daggone Christians over there, you just, I mean, y'all just a bunch of blockheads. <laughs> he never seemed to do that. He, he fed them. He had long suffering because he says here, he says, in me first might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to have life everlasting. Paul's the pattern that you and I should follow. That's why Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me. Watch what I do and do what I do. Be the example and then you can also tell others that are under you and under your direction, follow me. Can you say that now with a clear conscience? Can you tell people in your life, follow me. Be like I am. Mm. <laughs> oh mercy we need to strive to be in that situation where we can tell people follow me as I follow Christ be that example in long suffering remember it's slow to act out to show restraint bearing pain or suffering wrong without complaining to have patience and endurance that's what Paul was. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. We're going to close right here with this one. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. I actually got two more passages here, but this is one of the two. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. The Bible says in verse 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, Manner of life, purpose, watch it, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came into me in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me, yea, watch it, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's your lot in life, Christian. If you are going to live godly, you are going to suffer persecution. Go ahead and put that on your checklist because it's going to happen. If you are going to live for God, there are going to be those out there that find fault with what you're doing. They're going to find fault. Yes, sir. Where were you at? Second Timothy chapter 3. You said Corinthians. Did I say Corinthians? I misspoke. Second Timothy chapter three, verse ten. ten. My mistake. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience persecutions, afflictions which came into me at Antioch of, at Iconium, at Lystra with, what persecutions I endured now notice what he says there, I endured these things but out of them all the Lord delivered me yea, and all <coughs> that, will li- that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution If you don't live godly, then don't worry about it. (laughs) You're living like the devil, you're living like the world. The world loves its own. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Paul gave you this list to show you all these things I did, all these things I went through, they are a pattern for you. Go back and study the life of Paul. See how he responded in those situations. You'd be surprised. Last verse, 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. 
The Bible says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is to the preacher now. This is to anybody that's got a public ministry, but this is also for a Christian that wants to do something for God. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove and rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That's where the long suffering comes in. You preach, you teach, you show a pattern, you show examples. There's going to be people that come into your assembly that's going to find fault with everything you say, everything you do. And you've got to have that long suffering not to respond quickly and out of order. <clears throat> you've got to have some endurance. For well, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own ears shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned into fables. Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. That's what we're called to do in the Lord. That's what long-suffering is for you as a Christian. When you're doing right, be right, Stay right. Walk right. Talk right. Minister right. Let nobody find fault with you. The only way you can do that is always make sure that in the scriptures you are being correct before God. Pleasing Him. If you please God, it does not matter what others say about you. I've, I've, I've been doing, like I said, this a long time, and I'm, I'm, I've run into a lot of things over the years. And people find fault with things I do. It's okay. I know I'm doing what God told me to do. Don't bother me. Obedience is better than sacrifice. I am not a people pleaser. <laughs> you should not be either. Amen. You should be a God pleaser. And everything you do from the time you get up to the time you go to bed should be, what can I do to please God today? If you have that mentality, you'll always be right. And you'll always do right. Let's pray. Brother Devin, lead us in prayer as we close this part of the service, brother. Lord God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your long suffering toward us, Lord. Yes, Lord. You help us to have long suffering toward others, Lord. Help us to not be hearers of the word, Lord, but doers also, Lord. Amen, Lord. We just thank you Amen, for your word Lord. today, Lord. Thank you for this service. Thank you, thank Jesus. You. Just continue to, to bless us, Lord, to help us guide us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.